Hello again. All right. I think we can go ahead and get started today. So hi, welcome. Good afternoon. And welcome to our lunchtime presentation of Terrace, Utah, Population Zero. We are excited. <laughs> We're excited to see all of you here today to share the discoveries being made out at the historic railroad town of Terrace, Utah. I'm Elizabeth Hora. I'm public archeologist at the Utah Division of State History. And with me today, I have four panelists and presenters that I'm delighted to introduce you to. So first off are Drs. Chris Merritt and Mike Sheehan. Dr. Merritt is the State Historic Preservation Officer from Utah, and he specializes in interpreting the historical Chinese experience here in the Western US. Dr. Sheehan is the lead archeologist for the Bureau of Land Management's Salt Lake Field Office, and he oversees the protection of the Terrace Town site, as well as many, many other archeological sites in his field office. We also have with us today some friends and partners whose ancestors worked to build the Transcontinental Railroad, Karen Kwan and Margaret Yi. State Representative Karen Kwan is president of the Chinese Railroad Workers Descendants Union and her passion for serving her community has been incredibly valuable for helping people understand how the archeological work out at Terrace impacts our lives today. Margaret Yi is the chairperson of the Chinese Railroad Workers Descendants Association, and she has dedicated the last 55 years to serving the Chinese community here in Utah. And for all you Salt Lake locals, Margaret's the one who opened Ho Ho Gourmet on State Street in 1979, so she is quite a local legend. I am delighted and honored to announce these folks to you today. And without any further ado, let's hear about Terrace. Kicking it over to Chris. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And, and thanks everybody out there for joining today. Um, I'm so excited to spend the next hour and a half with you and my lovely folks here on the panel and, and share some of this incredible history that we've been able to work collaboratively between the state, the feds, and the descendant community with Karen and Margaret. It's It's been so much fun. And I see even some of our attendees today are some of the volunteers that assisted us on the excavations out there. and. Uh, it's just a really, really fun uh, experience, and we're learning a ton of information about Utah's past, Chinese past, and how it affects our future and our management here in, the, in Utah. So I'm going to kick it off with a video from the uh, West Desert District Manager, which is the overall Bureau of Land Management structure that manages oh, three-ish million acres in northwestern Utah, which this is one uh, very, very cool site. Um, and so I want to play a message from him first, and then we'll hop into a, the more formal presentation with uh, the four panelists here. So I'm going to share that now and try not to screw it up. So we'll see if I can do that. All right. So Mike, can you tell me if you can see this? I can see the, uh, the background logo. Yeah. Okay, sweet. I am Mike Gates, District Manager for the West Desert District of the Bureau of Land Management, Utah. I'd like to thank the Utah Division of State History and the Utah State Historic Preservation Office for affording me the opportunity to share with you my thoughts about Terrace and the groundbreaking work being done there. I would also like to thank the Chinese Railroad Workers Descendants Association for their wholehearted and deeply personal support of the work at Terrace. Finally, I would like to thank the, Her the Canyon Heritage Consultants for their technical expertise and analytical contributions to the Terrace project. In May of this year, I was able to visit Terrace. I was accompanied by the archeologist responsible for the ongoing field project there, Dr. Mike Sheehan of the Bureau of Land Management and Dr. Chris Merritt of the Utah State Historic Preservation Office, both of whom you will hear from later, and members of the Chinese Railroad Workers Descendants Association. It was an experience I will not soon forget. The archeologists explained the science behind their efforts and described what they are learning from, these, from those efforts. The insights being derived from the archeological research are to me truly astonishing. 
However, as I listened to the, me the members of the Chinese Railroad Workers Descendants Association describe their feelings about the, that research, the humanity of the broader effort became apparent to me. The archeology span of Terrace is not a sterile story recorded in bits of broken glass and pottery. It is a story of people from distant places and diverse ethnic backgrounds working together under conditions that would have been harsh beyond comparison to us. As I walked across the landscape of Terrace, I realized what a special and unique place it is. While the buildings, the trains, and the people are all gone, Terrace is anything but silent. Because of what remains there and the efforts of the people who care about it, Terrace serves as a window for understanding 19th century labor and ethnic relations in a frontier town that was quite large for its day. I was able to envision the residents of Terrace working in the rail yards, walking down Main Street to visit their favorite dining establishment, going home after a long day at work, or getting on a train bound for one coast or the other. I was able to experience in a very profound way what life in Terrace's Chinatown might have been like. Terrace is one of those places that you come away from changed. To my mind, Terrace is the jewel of all the sites on the Transcontinental Railroad grade that the BLM manages. It offers so much for research, for interpretation, and for opportunities to experience the past in a way that can inform us about our collective future. For these reasons, the BLM is actively pursuing a series of protective measures that will preserve the site for generations yet to come. Perhaps the most ambitious protective measure undertaken to date is the construction of a fence around the sites. It became evident this past summer that some visitors to Terrace were driving their vehicles across the site, causing considerable damage to the archeological surface deposits. The BLM worked with the Utah State Historic Preservation Office to develop fencing that would protect the site without incurring further damage. It was a big effort, but the resulting fence has been very effective. As a final thought, I'd like to say that I'm very impressed with the research, preservation and outreach efforts that compri comprise the broader Terrace project. Over the past two years, the BLM and the Utah State Historic Preservation Office have conducted field studies at Terrace, and I completely support those efforts. There is much to learn from our yesterdays that can inform us about our tomorrows. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today, and please enjoy the rest of the presentation. Okay, and so that's our, our good friend, Mike Gates, who oversees this, um, this part of the BLM lands. And so those of you that are joining us from the West and from Utah, you know the landscapes that our federal land managers and our state land managers have to contend with. These very austere landscapes with uh, lots of open land, lots of public use. And so as we talk about terrace today, we're going to start off by having uh, Dr. Sheehan tell us a little bit about the broader uh, impact of this on public lands. But I like to start with this slide, and also it's a, a great favor to our great partners. Is it's a little tongue in cheek when we say terrace Utah population zero is while there's no living people in this town site that was once bustling back in the 19th century. The stories are still there, and, and this photo of our volunteers from last year who, who joined us for an excavation and survey, you know, I ghosted in the town site because it's really hard when you visit to understand the nature of this town and its bustling nature, metropolitan nature with, you know, people from all over the world all on this landscape that now you drive through and you'll be lucky if you see that one jackrabbit that really hates my guts because every time I go out there, I bug him while he's sleeping. So... The, the stories we have are really important, and uh, this project is really a passion of everybody on this screen and dozens of other people. This work is part of a much broader impact and a broader need and a broader interest from a lot of people. So while we're the ones talking to you today, it really did take a village to get this project up and going. So from here, I'm going to pitch it to Dr. Sheehan to walk us uh, through some of the, the broader landscape. Okay, Chris, can you give me my screen back at the bottom? Uh, I don't think I can. Okay. Well, um, so what I wanted to do initially was put this in its, in its proper spatial context and historical context. Um, the Transcontinental Railroad, as, as we all understand it, 
extends over 1900 miles from Omaha, Omaha, Nebraska to Sacramento. And the, the construction of that railroad, especially the portion from Sacramento to um, Golden Spike here in Northern Utah was largely constructed by over 13,000 Chinese workers. And it was a, it was a monumental undertaking from, from the get-go. Um, this portion of, of the railroad was active from 1869 um, through 1904 solely when the Lucin Cutoff was constructed. And uh, what the Lucin Cutoff did was essentially allow the railroad to cross the Great Salt Lake roughly at Ogden. And um, it left this northern portion of the, of the railroad grade kind of high and dry. So after 1904, from until 1942, the railroad grade serviced essentially local traffic. And, and that stopped in 1942 when the, when the railroad was uh, decommissioned. So subsequent to that, it was the, the ownership of the, the railroad grade was transferred to uh, the, back to the federal government. And, and that occurred largely because there was uh, kind of an interesting uh, caveat in the original land grant that the railroad got. As long as the railroad maintained and operated as a railroad, the railroad companies were, were the, the titular owners. But as soon as that happened, it was supposed to revert back to the feds. And, and that, was, that was essentially the linkage that, that we used um, to, to reobtain um, ownership of the railroad grade. Now, as far as the, the, the historical archeological significance of this portion of the grade, which we refer to as the promontory segment is concerned, um, it's actually listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, that portion of the grade east of Golden Spike to Corinne was listed in 1994 and the portion west from Golden Spike to the Nevada border or Lucin was listed in 1994, I think. Um, so it's a, it's a very significant site. And, um, you know, it's 87 miles long and it's, it's complex. So it, it really is something that we, we cherish and we, we want to actively research that that site, and we're getting a lot of a lot of insight about about how things happened back in the late nineteenth century. Back to you, Chris. Ah, the trestle. So one of the things that the one of the things that the Lucin Cutoff did was create this this archaeological site that's that's essentially existed in a state of arrested decay since nineteen forty two. Um, we have, we have dozens of town sites and sidings, Harris being one of those major town sites that's very large. But we also have the grade itself, uh, the earthen grade, and all of the architectural features that comprise that grade. And that includes trestles like this one that range in size from, you know, 20 or 30 feet that cross a small wash to large trestles that span over 100 feet. And they're all timber. Uh, the trestles are all timber structures. We also have an array of culverts that um, that cross even smaller uh, drainages, and and those are stone. They're timber, um, and they're they're built to probably a half a dozen different types. Um, and we we want to research all of those, and we want to document all of those as best we can. And it's it's really quite a task in total. Just in terms of the architectural features, the trestles and the coves, we've got over 150 of them. And uh, just this past, in the past two years, we've done a rather exhaustive inventory of all of them. And, and that gives us a baseline now for, for moving forward and, and monitoring their condition because they are decaying. And um, it, is, it is a challenge to... Uh, to keep track of what condition they're in. 
And so we want to we want to try and stay ahead of that as best we can. Okay, thanks, Mike. And over to me. So Mike laid out where we are. Let's go back what it was. So as Mike mentioned, this northern branch of the what was originally constructed by the Central Pacific Railroad and then converted to the Southern Pacific Railroad. Um, this function as the main corridor of passenger and freight from 1869 until really the next Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1882. So for effectively 13 years, every passenger train going between San Francisco and Omaha, Nebraska and all points east came through this very western part of Box Elder County. Now, you can visit this 87 miles of Transcontinental Railroad grade and you can drive it. Uh, Mike and I were actually out there on Wednesday. We only had two flats and two washouts <laughs> and one maybe damaged rental car bumper. Um, but the scenic backcountry byway is really a fascinating landscape because it is an archaeological site that is 87 miles long with all these little strings of pearls of town sites and, and trussels and culverts. But as Mike Gates said in his intro, the real crown jewel for this landscape is Terrace. It's not saying that the other sites are less important. It's just this one is overwhelming. In 1869, as the Central Pacific Railroad was pushing toward Promontory Summit, there was an identified need by the company and engineers to create this maintenance hub between Elko, Nevada and Corinne or Ogden, Utah. There was needing, uh, if you had a steam train breakdown in this landscape, you couldn't haul it 140 miles either direction to maintain it. So they decided to build a maintenance hub here at Terrace, which is kind of equidistance between those points. Now we know the town site was established in 1869 and the real driver of this town's boom was the a huge 11 bay, potentially roundhouse uh, with where you could take steam engines off, do maintenance work on them, clean them, uh, fix them. That employed 100 to 200 folks in this town to do railroad related work, whether they were carpenters, blacksmiths, boiler makers, tin smiths, brass makers. And so this really created this desert into an actual bustling city. This photo from the mid 1870s shows an overview, probably taken from the top of coal bins or a water tank, overlooking the town site of Terrace. And you can see this two story depot and a bustling main street. Uh, there was numerous buildings here that really function as a real true town because not only were the railroad employees there, there was all these other folks running businesses. And then in the 1870s, we had several mining booms in Western Utah. So this became an anchor point for that commerce. And at its peak, uh, you know, good historical documents are saying 400 folks lived in Terrace. That could have fluctuated during its peak anywhere between 400 to 500. Some more um, creative stories say maybe upwards of 800. But we know in this landscape, four to 500 people called it home. But the last point is the one I want to drive, is that in the 1870 census, Paris had the third largest Chinese population in the state, only behind Ogden and Corinne. So Corinne was you know, further east. It's between Brigham City and Golden Spike National Historical Park and function as a, a big freight depot uh, location for a long time. But that many Chinese living in Terrace really speaks to the importance of Terrace to the railroad's operation. So in a nutshell, we know that at its peak, the Central Pacific employed between 13,000 and 15,000 Chinese workers in the 1860s during its construction. The lesser story, and this is what really spurred Mike Sheehan and I to investigate this site, is we built up to the 2019 150th anniversary of the Golden Spike, and so much attention was focusing on this May 10th story. And we wanted to broaden it, because as soon as this railroad uh, was finished, those Chinese workers spread back across to improve it. They started becoming the maintenance workers. And the Union Pacific, who came in from the east, the Chinese had proven themselves to be such great laborers for the Central Pacific that they switched their labor force to also using Chinese. And so on these tours, I always like to point out that effectively, if you were in the 1870s and you were taking a passenger train from Omaha, Nebraska to Sacramento, almost every mile of that railroad journey, you're seeing Chinese faces at these maintenance camps, fixing the railroad, and also largely Irish foremen um, overseeing that labor because maintenance was an incredible part of this experience. 
And so we know that the Chinese were the main maintenance crews for this railroad for really the next 30 years after the construction. 1869 till after 1900, the numbers really do show that the Chinese dominated the maintenance jobs on these railroads. Now, because of some federal legislation, so the 1882 Exclusion Act, which was the first federal law uh, targeting a nationality from immigration, and guess what? It was China. Uh, it really reshaped the experience of not only the railroad and its workforce, because they had to move to different immigrant labor, Japanese, Italians, Greeks, uh, but also really did shape the Chinese experience in the United States because of the effectiveness of closing the gate towards Chinese immigration. And we see that the population of Chinese across the American West plummets after the 1882 Act. And that is a type of you know, legal violence against the Chinese population that were so critical in the construction of this railroad surface. And so Terrace gives, a, gives us this really great opportunity to explore that Chinese contribution. Because when you look at mainstream historical documents, you don't get the Chinese perspective. Um, many of them didn't speak or write English, so they didn't show up in written records from their own voice. Um, and most of their remittances and letters, they're going back to China, not staying here in the United States. So really archeological investigation of this led us to better understanding the Chinese experience. But focusing on Terrace for a minute, I really want to underscore, this was a booming town in its day. When I show you the modern landscape, I think it's going to kind of overwhelm you on how it looks today, is that Main Street had two bustling hotels. They had over five saloons. They had a bakery, meat market, dry goods stores. And the archaeology that we've been able to do the last two years is actually telling us that there was at least one Chinese business on Main Street Terrace, something that doesn't show up in a single historical record. So that's where we're being able to piece together the history and also the archaeology to better tell the full story. So this is a, a painting I did of a reconstruction of, of Terrace Main Street, thinking about the color and the scale. Because again, trying to find creative ways to convey this, this town site was a thing. It's not just sagebrush and greasewood, that there was living people here with businesses, dreams, hopes, and sometimes uh, death. So how did Terrace grow? It needed water. And I like to highlight this. We're in extreme drought here in Utah. And we're hoping for more and more snow and rain this uh, winter, even though I know I'm not excited to drive in that all the time, but we need water. Utah is the second driest state in the union. And as the railroad came through Northwestern Box Elder County, there was a need to bring fresh, clean water to the railroad. And because of the amount of capital and labor, the railroad didn't bother going to water. It just brought water to the railroad. And in Ter Terrace's sake is that they had to build a 13 mile estimated buried aqueduct that went from the Grouse Creek Mountains where they uh, improved some springs at Rosebud and then used redwood logs bored through the center and then nestled piece by piece for 13 miles to bring fresh water in the terrace. And I always like to say water was first for the trains, second for people and then third for beautification. If you saw that initial photo of Terrace, you see the decorative trees that were planted. At, at its peak, Terrace did have ornamental gardens. It had ornamental trees. It was meant to be a town that lasted. And this pipeline was really the driver of that. It was upgraded to cast iron in the late 19th century, but effectively if that pipeline shut down, your access to water was pretty gone. So we've been able to work with Stanford and other researchers and we, we got a blueprint of what the ideal I, uh, terrace would look like. You see these nice organized rows of streets and lots, and, and you see the large railroad uh, coming right through the center of the screen. And over here, you see the uh, turntable and the roundhouse for maintaining those steam engines. And so it looked like a very organized landscape, doesn't it? Well, when you look at the reality, this is a, a modern aerial image of that same sort of scope. And you see the turntable, the roundhouse, machine shops, and this is all that Main Street foundations that the ideal of the railroad didn't always play out to real because people built where people wanted to build. Uh, but I like to kind of see those two work in opposition. Now, we've been able to get uh, some volunteers to help get us a better idea. So this is a drone footage looking over Terrace as it looks today. So the cars in the center are actually on the original Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, and Main Street is actually further west out here. 
So what we're looking at right now is that Chinatown. Uh, the Chinese community in Taros was spatially segregated from the white side of town. And the old adage, the wrong side of the tracks, it plays out here. The Chinese were behind the coal bins, they were behind, behind the cinder bins, they were behind the industrial works, and almost as far away from the European American side of town as you could possibly do. Now, there's no historical record that the railroad dictated they had to be separated from the white side of town, but there was in this 19th century so much anti Chinese violence and discrimination that the Chinese just as much for self-preservation as the interest of the European American population saying, let's just keep things on either side. Let's keep them separated. Um, and so the drone right now is actually over the old roundhouse and you can still see that curvature because trains worked in line. So you had this curve to maintain and pull them in. So kind of gives you a better idea of the landscape that's now out there. And this is public lands. And as public lands, you can go out there right now and visit this site and, and explore it. But we've seen the public do some naughty things since the 1940s um, when this uh, entire line was abandoned. Terrace itself was abandoned after the 1904 uh, loosening cutoff for effective purposes. The population of Terrace started declining in the 1890s as the railroad moved operational shops, kind of looking forward to the completion of Lucing Cutoff, which is that rail line that goes across Great Salt Lake. Um, so by 1900, the population of Terrace had dwindled. 1901, there was a destructive fire that burned most of Main Street. And then over the next de decade, the railroad moved buildings out, ranchers salvaged buildings, and now we have a truly archeological ghost town. But the public um, over the years, and even before it came public land, has visited the site with some disrespect. And so, Mike? So, um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the huge issues that we have out there is, uh, is looting and vandalism. And, you know, bear in mind that, that Terrace lies along what is now the largest continuous segment of the original transcontinental railroad. Nowhere else in the United States do you have 87 continuous miles of this thing. And with regard to Terrace, it's very remote. And that in and of itself isn't particularly unique as far as archeological sites go, because a lot of them are. But it's also a site that's bisected by the Transcontinental Railroad grade, which now serves as a backcountry byway that, that is during certain times of the year very heavily traveled. So we have a site that's it's remote and heavily visited, which when taken together, make it very difficult to protect. This has some pretty significant consequences for the integrity of the site itself and, and how we understand or how we can understand that site. So Chris, Chris has put together a, a really nice overview of, of just what happens out there when, when folks get into these very remote areas and, um, and just start picking through things in a, in a very disorganized, haphazard manner. Yeah, and this is an analogy, and some of the folks on here have heard me say this over and over again that there's two types of appeals when it comes to looting and vandalism. First is the legal. You know, this is public land. This is federal land. It's against the law to loot uh, and vandalize these sites. Um, you know, that's the legal. I like to apply the more personal and emotional plea is look around, think about your children or your parents. And was there a favorite book that they wanted to share, like a book they grew up with, like their favorite book ever. And they're like, they want to pass that story down to their children. Now, what if I took that book and I ripped a bunch of pages out and threw it away? And then I took a bunch more of the, more of the pages, ripped those out and shuffled them around and then gave the book back to you. In total, that book is still a book, but a lot of the meaning has been lost. The story is out of order. We're missing big chunks of the plot. That is the impact of looting and vandalism on archaeological sites. The ripping out of pages is visiting these sites and removing objects out of their context. 
you know, taking them completely out of the site. And during the 1960s and 70s, before the site was even protected, bottle hunting had become very popular in the American West. And so this site was descended upon by dozens, if not hundreds of folks looking for transcontinental railroad bottles. And our ethic had not quite caught up with, should we be doing this? Um, so looting is ripping those pages out. But the image on the right is something that we see more common today. And we see it on almost every large archaeological site. And you can visit those sites down in San Juan County and Bears Ears, the ancestral Puebloan sites. And you're seeing similar behavior of visitors walking across the site seeing objects, seeing artifacts, pieces of pottery and glass or, or arrowheads and projectile points, and not taking them from the site, but piling them. So the next people to visit can see all the cool stuff without having to wander around. Um, or a museum rock is what we used to call them, you know, expressing like, oh, look at the cool stuff I found. Well, that's the moving the pages around in that analogy. And so between ripping the pages out and moving the pages around, we lose a lot of the information that we can use to interpret the past and tell the stories of those that can't tell the story themselves. And this is a segue to, to our honored guests here today, Karen, Kwan, and Margaret Yee, is as Mark, Mike and I started taking folks out to the railroad grade um, for sort of the lead up to the 2018 or 2019 event, uh, the very first sort of tour we did were for the, the Chinese Railroad Workers Descendant Association, some other VIPs. And this was the first time that many of these people, if not all of the people, had ever been to a site like this. Uh, visitations to Golden Spike, you know, that was sort of the thing to do to, to visit and to learn. But very few times had anyone ever said, this is where people lived. This is where your ancestors lived. This is where they, this is their house that they built. This is the dish they ate off of. Um, and so the visceral experience that Mike and I got the first time that we had a diverse group of folks, not just the Chinese Railroad Workers Descendant Association, is that awestruck. It's like the amazing opportunity for us to tell these stories, but also the, the pain of why are people taking our history? Why are people destroying our, our connection to the past? And why can't we do more? And why aren't you doing more? And to an archaeologist, that is the charge, right? That, that was the time that Mike and I got hit upside the head and like, yeah, we need to do more. Um, and we, we tried to do it from multi-prong of education, outreach, and bringing more and more people out there so we could teach these good messages. Um, and the partnership with the Railroad Association has really been powerful because it takes this very scientific, very... Uh, archaeological approach and makes it very meaningful to the folks that we take out there. And it also translates better to non-Chinese or non-diverse participants of people belong, you know, people feel this differently about the site and those objects than you do. They're not just pretty, they're part of a past. And so I just wanted to uh, throw it over to our two honored guests today. Uh, Karen Kwan, who's the president of the Chinese Railroad Workers Descendant Association, also a state representative and also a professor, and Margaret Yi, who's the chairperson of the Chinese Railroad Workers Association. And as Elizabeth mentioned, uh, Margaret kind of founded the this you know second wave of Chinese immigration in in Utah by uh, her very long, passionate service to the community in fifty five plus years. So um, I'm going to pitch it to you, Karen, to to maybe give some thoughts to your first visit to the site, what this means to you, and, and um, any other thoughts that you may have. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, it, and welcome to everybody who's online. And thank you, uh, Elizabeth, also, um, and to uh, our, our other panelists and um, honored guests, and to our partners who worked on this um, uh, on this project. Um, Chris, it's, first of all, I'm struck by how many talents you have. <laughs> I didn't know painting <laughs> was one of those. Um, uh, this project, um, and it's an ongoing project, it really impacted my life. It really um, changed the way that I thought about who I am and, um, and what it meant to be a descendant of a Chinese railroad worker. 
Um, Margaret and I are going to first uh, talk about the Chinese Railroad Workers Descendants Association. We lovingly call uh, CRWDA because it rolls off the tongue so easily. <laughs> um, but we will first introduce the association and then uh, we'll talk about uh, our connections um, with the Terrace Project to our lives today. Um, and then we'll come back a little bit later and, and uh, follow up with um, what, uh, what it uh, continues to mean. How does it enrich our, um, our understanding of living history? Um, but first I wanted to, as you said, Margaret is just a living legend. Right in our in our in the state, not only in the Chinese community, but in the state. Um, and it certainly is an honor to be here to speak with <laughs> with everybody, um, with Margaret. Uh, when I first came to Utah uh, about thirty years ago, Margaret came to me um, and asked me if I would intern with her, as she was um, a, an appointee on the um, on Governor Lovett's Asian American Council. And um, actually that's how I first became introduced to Utah politics. Um, and maybe she had a plan for me, but I didn't know that that really did start my trajectory on becoming a state representative. So this is all due to her foresight and wisdom and expertise. Um, and as you say, uh, she has been a leader in so many uh, community organizations. Um, and, you know, gratefully she's, uh, asked me to participate in many of these uh, organizations worth, with her. Um, and I'm, I'm especially grateful to be able to serve as president of the um, CRWDA uh, because she and my brother founded this, this organization. Um, you know, when, when Margaret first came to me many years ago and said she had this vision to put together this uh, type of an organization, I thought, oh, how fantastic, how wonderful. Um, but I also knew it was going to require a lot of time and energy. Um, you know, and those are two things that I find very limited in, in my day to day. And I, um, I just remember thinking, how, how can we ever do this? Uh, but with, she's such a passionate advocate um, that, um, um, you know, it's not only her advocacy, but it's her great example of filial piety. Um, it, and that coupled with her boundless energy and, you know, that remarkable charm that she has, um, I, I couldn't say no. <laughs> and thankfully, um, uh, my brother also stepped into the role and uh, I'm just so grateful uh, for her and to my brother and, and also grateful to be able to continue on with his legacy. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the time over to Margaret now so she can talk a little bit more about the details of CRWDA, um, how we founded it and, and what, it's, uh, what the association's missions and goals are. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Kellen. Thank you, Chris and Michael and, and, and Elizabeth. What a, what a wonderful lunch and time. Yeah. Thank you for your great introduction too. And I talk about the Chinese Railroad Worker Descendant Association. And uh, like uh, Kellen said, we found this uh, uh, CRWDA in uh, June 12, 2017, CRWDA is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. Our mission is to protect, preserve, and promote and tell the story of the Chinese railroad worker. And why do we establish it? Because in May 10, 1869, 152 years ago, the Chinese people helped build the first transcontinental railroad. It transformed USA to the economic prosperity. But most of the people, they do not know about this at all. 90% of the workforce is uh, working in the Central Pacific is the Chinese railroad worker. They are hard worker, they are very skillful, 
the dedication, the commitment, and the sacrifice themselves. They complete the transcontinental railroad seven years ahead of schedule, supposed to be 14 years, but they completed in seven years. Before the completion of the transcontinental railroad, it takes a travel from San Francisco to New York, is, it takes 30 days. But once we complete, it takes seven days. Before it cost a thousand dollars, now it only cost a hundred dollars. This is really transform USA to economic prosperity. But their hard work, their great contribution is never been recognized. And they are being, being discriminating too. So they, they pay less and they have to pay for their own food and own, own food, they, the islands will pay much more. And uh, they are not included in the completion picture and uh, the celebration picture in the May 10, 89. And a hundred years anniversary and Phil Choi and the group of uh, uh, the activists from California, they supposed to schedule for five minute talk at the, uh, at the uh, 100 years celebration anniversary. But last minute, they cancel it, they cannot talk. We saw that 150 years is coming up along the corner. So Michael and me decided that we must do something. We cannot let this happen again in 150 years. We must let our voice heard. We must let people know the great contribution that our Chinese railroad worked in building the first transcontinental railroad. So we established the Chinese Railroad Worker Descendant Association very, very fortunately. And uh, yet at the 150 years, our uh, we we at the the CRWDA is the only Chinese official representative for working with the SPY 150. We have 20,000 people at 10 and our ancestor is being recognized. And we are so fortunately, and uh, the, our descendant, Kani Yang Yu is the uh, worker, the, the speaker at the 150th anniversary. And also, and Jiu, Jiu, uh, Jiu Xiu Lan and uh, Elaine Chow is also, uh, a place and commemorate the Chinese railroad worker. We, we are the Chinese, our ancestor is being recognized. We said that the Chinese helped build the railroad, railroad help, build, help build America. So, and we appreciate that. That my first time and went to the, uh, talk about the first time go to the, the, uh, the terrace is April 11, 2018. Chris in YCRWTA and us go. Five of us go at the first time. The first time is the Judge Michael Kwan, Kellen Kwan, Max Seolan, and me. We travel so many cities. That's the first time we ever visit that. And we thank you, Dr. Mello, invite us to go over there to visit. We travel by Kelton. Watercrest, Paris, you saw so many artifacts in the ground. It was amazing and appreciate what Chris's office did and then protected and preserved this place. It was so thankful for the work and dedication, professionalism and the passion that they doing in Paris. That in the 150 years Golden Spy anniversary, and there's 20,000 people attended. Everybody want to go there. We have 100 more, more than 100 uh, media from all over the world, from China and everywhere. And, and Chris gave up the once in a lifetime opportunity. And he stationed at the Telus, Telus from morning until night. He got that place, protect that place from looting and vandalism. This historical art, we are uh, we are really appreciate with his ironic uh, active art. We we you know we it is so wonderful have people like that to protect it and helping us. 
And, and this year in September, and Michael's office, BLM and, and Chris's office, and they put up the fence over there. Yet I was so, so excited and so wonderful have them to protect this. It says, uh, you know, this is, you know, we really, really appreciate all your work over there. Thank you so much. Okay, I guess it's Kelly's <laughs> turn. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. So I, I'm going to um, uh, talk a little bit about the connections that I made um, in visiting a terrace um, and, and how that impacts me today. Um, you know, that I, I actually don't know my ancestor's name. Um, I don't know. It, to my knowledge, no one in my family, my extended family, knows the name of that my ancestor who um, worked on that uh, railroad. And and perhaps we can find it, but in, in doing our own research, my brother Michael and I uh, were not able to find it. We, we researched um, birth records, death records. We we looked at census records, and we know that the names of the Chinese railroad workers were they they largely were not kept in railroad records. So we're not sure that. Um, you know that we're not going to be able to uh, find find out the his exact name, and so I sort of grew up a little bit disconnected to the stories. They were always there in my family. I always heard um, uh, many times from my mom or maybe her mother some stories of the um, of our our uh, histories, the personal histories. Um, but uh, because it was so um, sort of long ago and far away, um, and I never learned about this in school, I never really learned about um, the Chinese railroad workers or, or any other of our early Chinese immigrants, um, except for um, the stories of discrimination and racism, you know, I, it it seemed very rare, if at all, that I would uh, hear any stories of contributions to American societies of everyday, um, everyday workers. And, and I think this is what struck me um, when I first uh, went to a uh, terrace, um, that it, it sort of placed me in a physical space that perhaps my, uh, grandfather many generations removed uh, stood and it, um, it it made me feel connected not only physically but emotionally um, and I thought of uh, what that means you know and, and as I've learned more um, and as I've uh, studied and um, experienced and um, visited other sites it it sort of is continuing to um, uh, sort of gel in my um, understanding of who I am. I, I want to talk a little bit about a site that's not terrorist, but it, it fits into this story for me. And that is the, uh, um, the Car what we call the Carlin 13. These are um, 13 Chinese railroad workers that were re-entered recently, um, but they were found 25 years ago. Um, and so we have uh, um, some understanding about the lives of our uh, Chinese railroad worker ancestors from what we know from, um, from these 13 men. Um, and authors Su Fan Chung and Fred P. Frampton and Timothy W. Murphy in their article uh, wrote that they put it this way, that um, there was a lot of diversity that we didn't see within uh, Chinese railroad workers. Uh, they, and I'm quoting here, um, they had a modicum of wealth and class stratification, but that all of these men appeared to have harsh living conditions and they conducted strenuous physical labor that was evidenced in their bodies by physical trauma. Um, so couple this with, uh, uh, the fact that many had poor health um, and they had very limited health care. Uh, they also lived under cultural domination, institutional racism, discrimination, and anti-Chinese violence. Um, and what strikes me about these stories and this physical sight is that perhaps my grandfather, that's several generations removed, 
would feel a regrettable tinge of uh, familiarity if he saw the world today. Um, and that that is regrettable. That familiarity, though, um, it's not situated wholly in the regrettable, because what we also found out about the um, uh, Carlin 13 is that there was uh, much Chinese American integration, as Chris pointed out, um, and there was um, acculturation occurring as well as as the clothing on the bodies um, suggested um, that there was some desire possibly uh, for um, uh, some Chinese railroad workers that would like to remain in the United States. So I'm struck by how similar that co-mingling of Chinese and American cultures were, at least in their funerial, uh, funerary and burial practices. Um, it, it's so similar to that of my own generation. So what I learn from um, studying about the Carlin 13 men connects me to a, a grandfather that I, I fear I, I might never have known. And standing in that physical space um, where I can um, experience the harsh conditions, um, where I can, as um, uh, Mike Gates mentioned, the silence, I can hear that silence. Perhaps it wasn't so silent at the time <laughs> that he lived, but you know, these questions, did he stand where I'm standing? Did he live here? Did he work here? Did he toil here? Did he suffer here? Um, it brings up a, a very strong um, a tie to my own filial piety, uh, my own um, ancestral um, representation and um, my own feelings of a responsibility, not only to me and my family, but for generations to, to come. Um, we have lost many uh, people in our communities, um, two of which are uh, very central to this story of uncovering our history, our, our Chinese railroad history. Um, and, and that is, um, of course, my brother, Mike Kwan, but um, also we lost a great um, man in Corky Lee um, who has had also had the uh, passion um, to um, research and record and teach about our uh, Chinese uh, railroad um, community members. Um, and so it's with that connection to understanding what we might lose if we don't continue to uh, research and learn and protect our history that we won't have this for, you know, not only, again, not only my kids, but my kids' kids and their kids and for so forth and so forth. So again, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn the time back over to Chris before I start falling. <laughs> thank you so much, Karen. And thank you, Margaret. And um, in, in the pre-chat for this talk, you know, we were laying out the, the strategy and Karen and Margaret, oh, we don't have anything to say. We don't have anything to say. Like, uh-huh. You guys are the voice that gives us the kick in the butt to, to do good work out there and, and the passion and uh, our, our good friend, uh, Judge Kwan, that we miss. You know, it was all part of the, the effort to get this moving again. So thank you, you two. So we're, we're going to jump to now where we're going post, you know, 2000. You know, 19. And I want to just hold on this slide for just a split second is, um, as Margaret mentioned, we took the CRWDA leadership out in 2018 for the first tour. And that was really where it, it became very visceral to me and very real that we needed to, to do more, that the experience that Karen just mentioned of being on site where maybe her ancestor had lived, um, you know, we wanted to do more for the community. Um, after that experience. And so I remember Mike and I went to uh, Judge Kwan's chambers and we were talking about the 2019 tour and, and the conference that the CRWDA put together. And he sits us down. He's like, well, we want to do tours. I'm like, absolutely. But well, how many folks do you think we could get out there? I'm like, 30? Hmm, because, you know, to put this in perspective, uh, it's a three hour drive from Salt Lake to start the tour. 
and then you're on the grade for another four to five hours, and then you have to return for three hours, barring flat tires. <laughs> Um, and a long ways from anywhere. You're, you're two hours from a toilet um, at any given point. And I'm like, yeah, 30 seems good. And Mike's like, yeah, 30 seems good. And Judge Kwan's like, no, how about 200? <laughs> and, you know, it was, uh, you know, had the heart palpitations on that one um, and really made it real that the experience that Judge Kwan wanted for the folks coming to the conference was universal. He wanted to get everybody that was interested in seeing this landscape to experience this landscape. And so uh, Mike Sheehan and I, uh, Ken Cannon, who's a, a, a consulting archaeologist, and Mike Polk, uh, who's a consulting archaeologist, we all banded together. We got the boots on the ground. A bunch of my team got boots on the ground, and we made it work. You know, we estimated that at the end, we had two tours of about 110 people each um, that were able to take this landscape in. And it was a, a truly transformative experience for me to, to be able to share that physical connection with the landscape and then the artifacts on site. And then that led us in 2020 and 2021 to do the first ever excavations at Terrace um, by professional archaeologists. And it's actually um, a really incredible story. That's what we're going to spend uh, the rest of our waning time with, but we hope to save some time for some questions. So, Mike, we'll let you talk about field work. All righty. So, <clears throat> as, we, as we walked across this, this site on innumerable occasions, we, we really wondered how best to, to research it. During the run-up to the 150th anniversary of the, the Golden Spike event, we led these multiple tours, and, and each one of them started a terrace. So Chris and I discussed on more than one occasion how best to tap into the research potential, not just of the railroad grade in its totality, but specifically terrace, because terrace was this large site that, that had multiple layers that we could peel back and would inform us more about what life might have been like on the railroad grade as it was being built and shortly after it was completed. And the, and the big challenge with, with archaeological field projects is labor, because archaeology is one of those, one of those rare professions where it's kind of difficult to get a machine to do what we do. Um, they're, they're just kind of indifferent to the, to the nuances of an archaeological site. So we had to have people who were interested in getting on the ground, getting hot, getting dirty, but doing good quality work that was meaningful. And judging from, from what we've all heard here in the last half hour, there is a very substantial part of the population who visited Terrace for whom this was very consequential. So Chris and I both had experience um, with what's called the Passports in Time program that's administered by the Forest Service. And essentially what the PIT program does is provide volunteer labor for a diverse array of, uh, a diverse array of projects and an archeological project at Terrace uh, really did fit the bill um, perfectly in, in, that, in that respect. So, so we organized a PIT project. Um, I worked with the PIT project administrators to, to just handle the, the background logistics of this whole thing. And then Chris and I, and, and also Ken Cannon from uh, Cannon Heritage Consultants, sat down and, and hammered out a field plan that was doable within the window of time that we had. And and what we wanted to do was get as much data as we possibly could in that, in that small window. We, we didn't have a lot of time because people don't have that much time to volunteer for, right? So we decided to incorporate an approach that, that involved both modern technology and some other approaches that are, that are more typical of, of archaeological projects. And among the, the former kinds of approaches is ground penetrating radar. As far as we were aware, 
nobody had ever used ground penetrating radar before on on a site of this type and it, it would give us a little a little view below the surface that might guide us in determining where we might want to do some excavations and in that particular context ken cannon and, and his folks uh from cannon heritage consultants were were just monumentally helpful. They had the technology, they know, knew how to use the technology, and more importantly, they knew how to interpret the results. And, and that really helped us enormously out there. We, we decided to undertake some excavation. Um, they, start, they started out small and they, and they grew, and we decided to focus on Chinatown because there had been no excavations in anything resembling a Chinatown as far as as far as we were aware. Um, that gave us the depth, that gave us the, the, the time depth to, to look at. But one of the things that's really quite phenomenal to my way of thinking about Terrace is the surface deposit. In, in 40 years of, of doing archaeology all over the US and, and in parts of Europe, I have never seen a site like Terrace. It is for hundreds of meters in every direction, just a continuous carpet of artifactual materials. And on the face of it, it, it presents almost an unfathomable problem to try and sort out. How do you get information from a deposit that extensive? And so what we did was a surface examination. We, we divided the site up into controlled grid units and we did um, careful examination of what was in those various grids. And that provided us a, a basis for looking at the, the spatial variation that existed within that, that huge surface deposit. And then focusing in a little bit more, we looked at bottles because bottles oftentimes are, are marked with the manufacturer assembling, um, sometimes dates of manufacture. And all of those bits of information allow us to give some structure, some spatial and some temporal structure to that service deposit. It allows us at least some beginning way to sort out how those artifacts are gonna communicate us, to us about the past. Next slide. Okay, so over to me. Thanks, Mike, for the overview. Sure. Um, so I, I wanted to just highlight that you know, a lot of times when you take public to site and you talk about the fragments, people are like, hi, you're so disappointed that, that you don't find any whole bottles. And I'm like, well, honestly, fragments of bottles can tell us as much as really the whole bottle in the most cases. And when you think about people's trash behavior, remember, this was a railroad town. There's nowhere to put their trash, there was no landfill. So you would open up your back door and check it. And so that meant a lot of the artifacts we'd find are already gonna be broken. And so these fragments can tell us stories. And so, you know, I'm not gonna stay on this too long, but um, like the upper right, that's a, a bottle that was manufactured in Scotland, uh, filled probably with mineral water or some sort of a whiskey imported on the railroad, deposited behind a saloon on Main Street. And that can tell us the trade and consumption patterns of tariffs, how it was connected to this worldly uh, good and commodity flow. And then the data, you know, archaeologists are all about our data. We can start looking at patterns and looking at temporal patterns, looking at spatial patterns and looking at function. As you can see by the chart, uh, behind Main Street had a lot of booze, um, uh, but also lots of medicinal and lots of soda. Uh, but this can tell us patterns because we don't have great historical records of what foundation pit is which business. Looking at these patterns could maybe help us identify a hotel versus a saloon versus a Chinese business. So the bottle survey was extensive and we had an amazing uh, volunteer, Bill Lindsay, who is just a savant when it comes to historic bottles and his wife. And we kept them on an island for two weeks just walking around identifying bottles uh, to keep them away from the other volunteers. That's a joke, they're lovely people. Uh, but there's, there's some uh, of the bottle survey, but the real, the real money here, 
is the, the excavation that we undertook. And we did test four different areas, but I want to drive into the big find is we started looking around for useful places to excavate. We used um, the help of Ken Cannon um, to do some GPR work, but then we also used the, the classic old school archeology span method of what feels right. Um, and we found some vertical timbers in Chinatown sticking out of these sand dunes. And this environment is so austere, there's sand dunes out there. And Chinatown was actually built into the backside of one of these. And so we're like, okay, we have some upright posts, let's dig down, we think it might be a wall. And we were thinking we were dropping on the outside, but in reality, we, and this is kind of a step-by-step -step as we drop in control levels, start seeing all those flecks of charcoal. At some point, this structure burned. And as we hit the bottom, there you go, intact 1869, 1870 floorboards of a Chinese house on the Transcontinental Railroad. That is killer right there. I mean, that is the excitement that you can only have by having this thrill of discovery of by, you know, the hard work and all these volunteers, we were able to actually identify this Chinese home. And by its end, this is the first fully excavated Chinese home on the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, regardless of state. And that's a pretty exciting data point. And it really helped us understand the technology they were using to build it with the materials and also the style. And it's actually we think today buildings are horizontal, you know, planking and siding. These were all vertical set posts and boards, probably surplus from the railroad itself. And this was really exciting. So we came back the next year and fully expanded this. But I always like to take this point. This is slow and patient work. Archaeology is a far thing from sexy history channel shows. It is dirty. It is hot, then cold, then wet, then frozen, um, and it's also detailed. And so these are photos of our volunteers doing the painstaking work. This is what I feel really does fully separate us from those that go out and treasure hunt, is we record everything we do. We divide it into squares, we record each level within that square, uh, we carefully keep notes. We we screen all the dirt that's coming out um, through these sifters that we have. And then when we hit those intact floorboards, we slowed the rest of the way down and we're using hand brushes and bamboo picks. Um, Archaeology is a slow and patient practice. And that's because we are destroying the thing we are studying. And so we need to make sure that we're doing it in the most uh, meaningful way possible. At the end of the day, at the end of the second year of project in 2021 in May, we had fully opened up that house. And there's Elizabeth, um, not the best photo, but it's the best photo I have of this overview, um, showing the extent of the house. But again, to make this real, there's the foundation, there's the extent of that house. It's a small house. It's only about uh, seven and a half feet long uh, by about 12 feet Long. So it's a very small house, but for three, four guys living in it, uh, Chinese workers, it was probably a nice size to keep warm and, and cool in the summer. And then when you add the walls and the door, you know, we have the first ever image of what a Chinese home would have looked like on the transcontinental. And when Mike and I first started working out there, we had pictured dugouts, you know, very rudimentary structures dug into the hillside. When in reality, the Chinese had much more formal houses, much more of what we would consider classic workers' housing. And so that helped us spell yet another myth that we had concocted in our own mind of this more uh, rough and tumble life. No, they lived in, in formal houses. Um, I want to do the, the short switch out to this because I think this is really important. What Elizabeth was doing there was um, getting us a 3D model of that excavation unit. And so she used her iPad that you can just buy right now. Um, can you guys see that? You guys can see that. Let me. It's always something technology, right? Um, so can you see the uh, 3D model now? Mike? Yeah. Yes, oh, yeah. Yep. Thanks. Just someone to say. So this is actually <laughs> the output of a, a personal iPad taking hundreds of photos and being able to stitch together. But it gives you the feeling of there's the back wall, there's the intact floorboards, um, really a great way to capture that, that more interactive way of thinking about this site. 
And I want to highlight two things on this while we're talking. First thing is in the corner, we actually found a small wooden box. You see a little bit still there in this photo. Well, this was uh, this is what I jokingly call my white boy moment is while I was given a tour on public day, I was talking about this little box we found and you know, maybe this was something for someone's personal effects in the corner of the house. And, and Karen stopped me and she's like, well, most of us have Buddha shrines in our house. You think that might be it? I'm like, yeah, that, that's probably more accurate. I have a feeling. Um, but you know, that's why working with the descendant community, I feel is such an important part of the story because I'm coming at it from my worldview and my experiences. And so having that dialogue with the descendant community, I think is critical. The second thing I want to highlight is the slightly sadder is when you, when we started excavating, we saw, oops, give you guys motion sickness, see the floorboards. And then there's sort of this circular hole cut through it. Someone had beat us to this home. Some looter or vandal, probably in the 60s or 70s, had excavated into this looking for bottles and had gone through the floorboards. Now, while as disappointing as that was, that did not mean that there was no value left in this site. There is tons of information that we were able to get out of this excavation. And so this is a fun way to think and interpret that history. And so back to the presentation, and I know we're starting to wind down on time, so I'm going to fast forward here a little bit. Not too far. So the excavation was really important. Reconstruction of the house. Um, we did make some new friends. We had some scorpions. We had a couple nice, nasty little spiders. You know, that's a very quick way to get someone out of an excavation unit, by the way, is pull up one of those guys. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the material that we found. Um, we found thousands of artifacts that we are still working to get a plan together to get them processed, analyzed. We're probably going to be doing yet another volunteer project, but this one's going to be a lab-based over the winter uh, to get these artifacts processed. But they seem mundane. You know, we have a broken rim of a tin can. We have the back of a rivet of a gene. We have a marble. And on that very far left is actually a imported Chinese stoneware pot that would have probably been brought in with soy sauce in it. And so it's like a little teapot looking thing. But all these artifacts together can help us illuminate the story of those Chinese men who lived in that home and those that lived in that community. So I'm gonna walk you through a few of the artifacts really quickly and, and talk about each one quickly. Uh, the one on the left is actually a surface find, and this is what we call a wintergreen bowl. And this is a style of Chinese porcelain that was popularized in the late 19th century. And it came in bowls, saucers, cups, and flat bottom spoons, and was a slightly more expensive wear. And this one we collected, uh, one, because it was a great example of this type of ceramic, but two, it does have a mark on it that can help us potentially down the road research to where this was made in South China. Now, the one thing about Chinese immigrant, immigrants in this period is that the there was an extremely complex uh, commodity chain to get these supplies here. And so everything I'm showing you came from China, uh, unless I otherwise tell you so. And it was shipped on rail all the way to Terrace and then sold or brought with the workers. On the right is a, a Chinese coin we found. This is what you know looters and folks really want to find are these coins. Well, uh, this is probably one of the oldest historic artifacts in the state. This thing was probably minted in the 1600s or early 1700s. Uh, but was brought with the Chinese uh, railroad workers. And oftentimes this was used as a good luck charm, as a, as a wear it as a necklace. And oftentimes in homes, the, the Chinese workers of this period would keep strings of these inside the doorway to protect the home and to give it good luck. And so Phil finding that, again, starting to bridge the gap from 2021 to 1870. But this is really, because of the conditions out there, we are getting a very good glimpse at food waves. And yes, your eyes do not deceive you. Those are peanut shells that we found on the excavation. Those are 19th century peanuts that we were able to find. And if you think about, and Margaret, you know, I'm sure you know, peanuts are a factor in most Cantonese style foods. And so seeing that tells us about the diet of the workers. Uh, we did find coconut husks. Uh, probably came whole and then broken. We did find uh, Chinese dates and also even melon seeds. These are all very fragile organic artifacts that because of the soil, it was been well-preserved now for 150 years. 
And as we work methodically to analyze these artifacts, they're going to tell us more about the diet of these workers. And then the one on the far left, that is the uh, top of a Chinese liquor jar. And so this would have been a medicinal liquor or used in cooking. But again, all of this factoring in to give us like that sense of, you know, what was that life like in that small home in Terrace in this landscape with traditional foods from home mixing with this very bland and, and sort of foreboding landscape of Northwestern Utah. And so as archeologists, if you ever meet one, never ask like, what's the coolest thing you ever found? Because you're gonna get an eye roll uh, because we don't look at artifacts in that same way. Um, but Mike and I both picked kind of our favorite artifacts from this excavation. And so Mike, I'd let you start on, on yours on the right. So what you see on the right is a reconstruction of a plaster molding. Um, I was at a terrace with a couple of colleagues and we were walking down Main Street. And as we got toward the west end of Main Street, standing right next to what looked like a residential house pit, I noticed these broken fragments of what looked like plaster. And it struck me as kind of odd. So I picked it up and I started piecing it back together. And literally what you see in that photograph is the reconstruction of that object right there in the field on that day. And the reason that artifact struck me is that it's a decorative molding. When you look at the photographs of Terrace or you reflect back on the photographs of Terrace that we saw at the beginning of the presentation, it doesn't come across as the kind of place where you're gonna find a whole lot of conspicuous consumption. A lot of it looks pretty utilitarian, but what, what this particular artifact said to me is that at least in certain portions of Terrace, there was enough wealth to invest in something that was purely decorative. It's a, it's a, a local kind of conspicuous consumption. So, that there was enough there um, in the way of you know income potential, financial potential, fiscal resources that that folks could invest in things that were strictly decorative. And um, to my mind, that was that was kind of significant. And also, <clears throat> um, what what these kinds of artifacts do, and and Chris will talk about this more in a minute, I suspect. It, it really informs us about, about the danger of looting that we talked about earlier. These are little insights that you get into life in Terrace between 1869 and 1904. But if somebody had put that thing together and walked off with it, there's no guarantee at all that that, that little window on the past would still be open. It might be closed forever. So. So that was my, that was my sort of uh, eye opener out there at Terrace. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And also the little chandelier danglers that we found as well oh, yeah. in the excavation unit. Just it speaks to challenging some of our mythos about the American West and these towns. Is it was a little bit nicer uh, in this landscape than we pictured. So my artifacts on the left, and it's small, but as soon as it came out of the screen. I knew this was this was my favorite is this very simple artifact. It's hand carved uh, slate and it was a Chinese inkstone and a depiction is on the bottom right. And yes, that is my brother. He's the curator of a, a Chinese museum up in Oregon and he actually had some examples of intact Chinese inkstones. And this is what you would have been using if you had been doing traditional Chinese calligraphy writing. You would have a solid block of ink a little bit of water on that, that platform, grind it until you make a nice ink, uh, and then you could do your letters. The reason I love this so much is that it is an amazing um, glimpse into challenging some very stereotypical ways of looking at the 19th century Chinese experience. So if you look at a lot of records, if you look at the newspapers, it's written from a, a European and, and European American perspective. And the Chinese were often depicted as um, illiterate, working class, drug fiend, you know, all this stereotypical language to further 
exclude and, and justify the actions of our government and our people on this immigrant population. When in reality, many of these workers were literate. Many of them were here supporting families back in China. And thinking about this Chinese worker sitting at a kerosene lamp after working 10 hour shift in 30 degree weather on the railroad and taking the time to perhaps write a letter home to a wife or a, a child that they might never see again. And that they're here in our country trying to raise money to support them back in China. That to me transcends the science of archeology span into a very personal experience is that we don't have the letter most likely that this man sent home, but you can put yourself in that situation, thinking about supporting your family from across the, the ocean. And this guy might have very well died in Terrace or somewhere else. Where did he go before and after this? And, and that artifact just tells that poignant story of a connection across the Pacific that we kind of lose sight of in classic history. Um, so moving quickly, as we're running out of time, um, is we did have on the end of the, the, the last week of the field project, we did have Lieutenant Governor Deidre Henderson come out. Uh, that was amazing to be able to get her on the site and talk about this history and Senator Scott Sandel from Fox Elder County, because I think that's really important for our, our lawmakers and policymakers to interact with this stuff on the ground and to, to make the idea of archeology span more personal to them. And so having the opportunity to have these folks on site with Aaron uh, and the rest of the Workers Association, I think did help us better articulate to policymakers the importance of these stories and the importance of their uh, protection. Now, classic archeological method is once we're done excavating, we backfill it. Um, but this is where the, the Railroad Association and its members came in really important is that before we did that, um, Margaret, uh, led us through an honoring of the ancestors. And, and I think this is yet another good thing for us to think about as archaeologists is that we've touched somebody's history, somebody's ancestors, and we should honor their lives, their contributions to the construction of the railroad, but also our state and our United States. And this ceremony was a way for us to offer that uh, respect to the descendants and to the ancestors before we did the, uh, the backfilling and then walked away from the site. Um, real quickly, as Mike uh, Gates talked about at the beginning, we were able to, to get with the BLM and my staff and BLM staff went out and erected a protective fence to help better protect this site from those that are starting to walk across it and pick up artifacts and pile them. So some real basic light infrastructure to give some protections to this site long-term. Um, and if you go visit this site, please respect that fence. Look at the interpretive sign and, and respect the, the lives of the people that came before us. So what's next? As I mentioned, we have a lot of work to do on the laboratory analysis of this material. This is gonna take a long time. We did two weeks of excavations. It's probably gonna take us three months of laboratory processing to get this into a point where we can start chewing on the data and putting some special analyses together, let alone the report writing. Uh, we do want to do more fencing and we do have plans to do additional interpretive signage. Because right now there's one sign out there, the one I showed a picture of that has the bullet holes through it. We are in place those, but we also want to add another five panels. So if someone does come out there, they can start to get a better feel of the real true depth and breadth of Terrace. Um, and then the last thing is, uh, after the end of our project in May, KSL ran a great story and a member of the public who lives in Arizona reached out. And he's like, my great grandfather uh, lived in Terrace and he had the meat market in Terrace and I have some family history. Would you like it? And so he sent me his, his information and including his original photos uh, from his family. I scanned them, sent them back, a very trusting man. But in that oral history, we did actually identify the location of the potential Chinese cemetery in Terrace. In the 19th century, most Chinese immigrants, if not all, were not allowed to be buried in consecrated ground. And so the Terrace Cemetery uh, does not have any Chinese burials in it. But this oral history of his grandfather, who was a small child in Terrace, gave us the X marks a spot to go look for the burial ground of those Chinese workers. And we can use canine forensics teams to go do that investigation. And we hope to bring them out in the, the next year. 
last, second to last slide, I promise. Uh, you could tell why we couldn't do this in an hour brown bag, by the way. You see how much that the story really entails. But Mike and I are nothing without the people in this photo. The labor that they were able to put for us for two weeks, um, and this not including the truckload of food that the Chinese Railroad Workers Descendant Association brought out for the public open house um, to feed everybody. Uh, Su Lin Santi, who camped with us that whole week and, and gave us food and kept us happy. And, um, you know, our volunteers that came from around the country to volunteer and our agency partners. And these are the people that made this presentation possible. And so I just wanted to highlight that before going to our acknowledgement slides, thanking everybody and probably their dog. I think there is probably a dog on this slide at some point um, because without this team, we couldn't have accomplished this. So with that, um, I will pitch it to a slightly truncated Q&A. So thank you all. Thank you guys. What a cool presentation. Um, that was information packed and it's reflected in a lot of what I'm seeing in the chat and the QA. So we do only have a few minutes left. Um, if you've posed questions in the chat and QA and we don't get to it, we will answer it via email sent out to all participants here today. But let's get through whatever we can um, before, before 1.30 and we turn into pumpkins. So do we have a fundraising website for this project? That's a, that's a question that was asked and I'm interested too. We'll take the money. Um, so <laughs> I think I think there's two ways for, for me to answer this is that we are um, at the state of Utah. We do have uh, the Utah State Historical Society, of which we're a part of, um, that can receive donations to support this work. And if you are interested in that, please contact any of us here and we would take that donation and put it towards this project. But you could also uh, work with the Chinese Railroad Workers Descendant Association as a donation as well. So I don't know, Karen or Margaret, if you want to say anything to that, but um, we will happily take support because you can see there's a lot of lot of needs um, to keep this project moving. And we will send information in that email. We will also take gladly take your donation and thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, Ms. Zhou asks, uh, a lot of questions about um, foodways, actually, which I love as an archaeologist. So she mentions that she's read that um, some Chinese people living in these kinds of communities were growing fresh veggies, boiling hot water for tea, and that these practices kept them healthy, especially relative to some of the other folks out there. Can you guys maybe comment a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is probably not the best landscape for gardening. But we're pretty sure we found a garden um, out here as well. Um, is that while the soil might not be rich, it probably was being cultivated and most likely by the Chinese themselves. Like even downtown Salt Lake in the late 19th century had dozens of uh, Chinese gardens producing fresh produce for market. Uh, so we, the likelihood of the Chinese growing food there, high. Uh, I think that that's another facet. And we can try to find that archaeologically as well by looking at pollen and, and food waves and, and seeds. Um, so yes, totally. And yes, the, the, the story about boiling water to make tea as a way that they avoided illness, 100% true. Um, Mike and I's ancestors, you know, we were largely, not so much, <laughs> not so much. we were drinking she bottles is. that were brown and green. Um, and that was our water. <laughs> and then eating boiled beef and potatoes. Our, our diet was not a pyramid, it was more of a flat bar. Um, versus the Chinese who had a much more robust diet with many more types of foods, plus that complex uh, commodity chain bringing this food into the state. And like we found fish vertebrae that were probably dried uh, and imported for Chinese consumption as well. So they were eating well, they were drinking well. Um, that's why the railroads loved them is that they had very few sick days. And so uh, it was another factor that the railroads wanted to continue to exploit that labor. And to the, to the point of uh, investigation of this sort of thing down the road, we've talked about doing some systematic soil sampling out there from the surface down to a couple of feet to see if we can pick up uh, pollen or phytolith profiles that will indicate the presence of a garden. And the thing is, out there, there is very little background radiation in terms of vegetation. 
So if you're going to find pollen, you're going to find phytoliths, those sorts of things. It shouldn't be that difficult to attribute them to a garden type place or not. They also, they go, go deep berry over there. Then uh, last year, uh, 150 anniversary and, and Kellen went to buy so many from, uh, from the Utah State University. We grow lots of goji, is called the Phoenix tear. And that's the Chinese railroad worker, they grow that. They still are going a lot of uh, line out in here. Yeah, it, it is that. It's from China, that goji berry. Yeah, there is a lot going on with the food at Terrace. We could, we could definitely fill up another entire hour long presentation but we are running a little over time. So we have lots more questions. I guarantee we will circle back with you guys on these answers because they are fantastic questions. Um, but for now, uh, I, I wanna just give a little bit of a, a summary and a little something to leave you with here today. Um, so we're here celebrating International Archeology span Day, which technically is tomorrow, October 16th. International Archeology span Day celebrates archaeology and its contribution to society. And we hope that you all have had the experience of archaeology touching your life today. And I especially hope that you come away from this presentation understanding how fragile archaeology is. It's really up to us to protect places like Terrace that are so meaningful to our history and our heritage. To learn more about how to protect the past, um, I'm dropping a link in the chat and it is bit.ly slash pledge to save, save spelled S-A-V. Um, so that link is in the chat and I'll also put it in the comments for this video as well. Um, the other thing we've got going on for International Archaeology Day is a scavenger hunt across the state. I have distributed several thousand sticker decals and posters celebrating Utah's archaeology around the state and you can find those at your local library. Um, so these are totally free and they are our way of helping or of, of uh, they're our way of having, um, of saying thank you for you guys for helping us all protect the past. So thank you one more time um, to all the panelists and presenters today. Um, and thank you all here on the webinar for joining us.